The topic of in classical genetics that probably causes the most angst is epistasis. So what epistasis turns out to mean is when one gene modifies the phenotype of another gene. We're, this concept is such a, wait, what's going on? That we have an entire lab devoted just to this one lab, or this one concept. And basically what we can see, because we're going to do these at the simplest version that exists, which is dealing with two traits, is it's an alteration of the 9331 ratio. The way you get that 9331 ratio, big A, little a, big B, little b, cross big A, little a, big B, little b. That's how you get to that ratio. Which means all of these problems, when you see them, somewhere in the problem, this cross needs to come into existence. And if this cross doesn't come into existence, you screwed up somewhere. So it's a good little fact or a little check on yourself to make sure, am I following the process right? Because when we start to see this alteration of this 9331, to get to that, that cross needs to happen. What do I mean by an alteration? What happens in epistasis is we start to combine phenotypes, meaning some genetic combination prevents a phenotype from existing. What's a 9331? Dominant A, dominant B. The 3 would be a dominant A, recessive B. This 3 would be a recessive A, dominant B. The, a, the 1 would be recessive A, recessive B. Whatever that looks like. Recessive epistasis is when these two, the 3 and the 1, combine together and make one phenotype. This still adds up, bless you, 9 plus 3 plus 4 still gets me 16. 9 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 is 16. But still gives me 16. And if I look, I can pair this up, it's just those two combine to make that 4. Dominant epistasis, it's a 12 to 3 to 1. What's that? Take the 9 and the 3, and they combine together to give you one phenotype. I can't tell the difference between these two in dominant epistasis. Complementary gene action would be you're all dominant, or we get the 7. So that 3 and the 3 and the 1 gives you that 7. Well, what other combinations could you come up with? We can come up with a... 9 to 6 to 1. How would you do that? Add the 3s. You could get a 15 to 1. How would you do that? 9 plus 3 plus 3. You could even get a 15 to 0. How would you get a 15 to 0? Clearly, the one is lethal. When zeros appear, there's a lethality that shows up. We don't have our normal multiples of four. Uh-oh, there's a lethal in there. The way this manifests is kind of weird. And I'm not going to pretend like this is one of those concepts that you're going to say, Oh, I get it. Duh. It's not one of those. This is a, you have to work at this idea. It, I remember being taught it. And by remember, I can say, I remember the words being used. And that was it. When I started grad school here and teaching the lab, and then this lab showed up, I remember sitting there looking at how the crosses were done, and I was like, Nope, this is not real. I, this, none of this is making sense to me. 
And then I just practiced, practiced, practiced. And literally it was, I probably spent for that one lab, probably like six hours just by myself doing the problems and then waiting. And then I did them again until eventually it was, oh, I see, I, I see the, I see how it works. So this is going to be one of those where I'm going to let you know this is showing up on either your next quiz or it's showing up on the final. It's going to be in one of those two spots. This is not going to be one of those where you can just say, oh, I'll figure it out later. You have to work at this one. Because I'll walk through it and you'll be like, oh, I get it, I get it, I get it. The moment you step out that door, you are fully aware, nope, none of that happened. You have to practice this one. Very much so, you have to practice this one. So I'm going to show you how three versions of epistasis recessive, dominant, and complementary gene action turn out to work. For this to occur, I need to put in some symbols. So we're going to be using A's and B's. So for all of our crosses, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have A's and B's. I don't know what A means. I don't know what B means. It doesn't matter. The ratio I'm going to get should be a 9331, but this is going to get manipulated. In recessive epistasis, it's a 9 to 3 to 4. In dominant epistasis, it's 12 to 3 to 1. Complementary gene action, it's going to be a 9 to 7. Do I expect that you memorize what those words are? No. Would I expect that you could come up with the ratios? Yes. That should be fair game. So what's going on? So in recessive epistasis, RE, recessive epistasis, what we can draw out for us is three different stages. We have our total recessive. We have our total dominant, or our dominant, and then we're going to have some weirdo in between. That one there is clearly going to be my 9. I'm going to get full expression of both genes. And that's going to give me some phenotype. I'll call it phenotype 1. What we have in the middle, and this is where it starts to get a little fuzzy, is I can either have a big A, I could either have a big A, big A, or a big A, little a. I don't know which one it is. So the way I write that is I just put a little dash. It's dealer's choice. Once I have one capital A, it doesn't matter what you put next. That's what that underscore means. That's why I also write this here. That could be a big A, could be a little a. Could be a big B, could be a little B. It doesn't matter. I have that. My other option would be Little A, little A, big B, and then dealer's choice. What we could say is you need A to allow B to function. So A must happen first so B can do its job. So if I were to look at that, obviously this one here has some phenotype associated with it. I'll call it just phenotype 2. There's one of those, there's three of these, there's three of these. If this is a true statement, you need big A to allow big B to function. Which of these two, the first one or the second one, is going to look just like the double recessive. You see the problem? If I want big B to be expressed, there must be a big A. Because A is necessary for B, yes. Would this one here, this first one, big A, 
then I don't know, then little b, little b, look like the double recessive? The answer is it should look different because I have a big A. But little b doesn't, isn't doing anything. So I'm getting at least whatever A is. I'm not getting anything from the B. But A is going to give me some type of response, which means the second choice and this first choice look different. If I look at this one, if I want that B to manifest, if I want to see its results, I also must have a little a. I must have a big A. But if I have a little, if I only have little a's, the result is this is indistinguishable from this one. The recessive is holding back that dominant allele. The term epistasis means stand upon. Meaning one gene is literally shoving the other one down and not letting us see what's happening. This one, so these two here, are indistinguishable from each other. They have different genotypes, but when we stare at it, I don't, I can't see the difference between them. It's kind of like we're going to paint some walls. So to paint the walls, we need to give you paint. We need to give you a paintbrush. So if I give you those two things, shouldn't you be able to paint the walls? And the answer is, of course. There is a third component there. What is it? You need a wall. If I never provide you the wall, it doesn't matter what else you have. You must have the wall present. If that A, if I don't have a capital A, capital B, it doesn't matter what I wish to do with it. I need the wall first so I can at least have, a, have the paint. That will give me the paint, but I need the paintbrush too. So if I don't have a wall, can't paint anything. If I have the paint, well, I guess I could, I could try, but there's nothing to paint. So if I have big A, I have my paint, at least I can just throw it. Is it going to be pretty? No, but you'll get something. But if you have everything all together, we can paint the wall. So these two combine. This one here has a different phenotype, phenotype 3. And obviously, this is the final product. We end up getting three options, but two of these are indistinguishable from each other because the recessive is taking everything down. So if recessive epistasis means a recessive is holding back a dominant, What do you suppose dominant epistasis is? One dominant can trump the other. So it's a dominant that can trump a different genotype. So if I write out the same spiel, one, three, three, and nine. What I need to be able to get is 12, three, and a one. If I tell you all you really need of these two genes to get full expression is a capital A, what does that mean? It means that's obviously going to give me full expression. But what else will? The second one will. 
these two are indistinguishable from each other. They will look the exact same, even though they're clearly different. So then what's going on with this guy? We're going to get some lesser expression. And then this one here is just sad. The last one I ask that we write out is complementary gene action. If you're curious why I'm picking on these three, these are the three that show up in your lab. And one of the things you're going to be asked to do in lab is going to be explain how the epistasis works. So might as well give you the answers now instead of making you struggle and say, I can't figure this out, this is so hard. In lab, it's going to be specific to a situation, and then you could actually see where, oh, I, can, I totally see how you know, this is all that's needed to get what I'm seeing. Like It becomes far more obvious when you have examples, but I don't want to corn kernels with you all because I don't want to explain the anatomy of a corn kernel. So it's being expressed, but that one wins. This dominant is all that you need. So there's something there, but it's being overwhelmed by A. So A is all you will see. Same thing with here. A is all you see. B will give you like half-hearted version, but if you have the full versus the half-hearted, you see the full. It's not codominant because one is clearly trumping the other. Complementary gene action is similar to codominance. Complementary gene action means they're complements. Complements require two genes that can give you the same result. So here, nope. A and B are similar. But you need both for full function. So they're similar to each other, but you need both for the full expression. By the way. Which? I'm adding that in to tell you what this means. It would make it harder to interpret this. You could, what, like, if you go through these and do these often enough, eventually you could come up with the blurbs yourselves. That's kind of mean to do to you all right now. So I'd rather give you the blurb. So if you need both of them to get full expression, That means that's obviously going to be the 9, because you need both to get full expression. So that means if you don't have both, they're, it's kind of a dud. You, it's full expression or, oh, uh, it sucks. So it's all or none, in a sense. Which means missing one of them is enough to say, well, sorry, you don't get the expression. Also means if you miss the other gene, sorry, you don't get full expression. Which also means if you're missing both of them, sorry, 
you don't get expression. It's both or nothing at all. That's why it's a 9 to 7. Let's see this as an example. Pure breeding strain of squash that produces disc-shaped fruit was crossed with a pure breeding strain having disc-shaped fruits crossed with strain having long fruits. The F1 had disc fruits, but the F2 had a new phenotype sphere composed of 32 long, 178 sphere, and 270 disc. Propose an explanation for these, these results and the genotypes. So we went from disc cross long. That gave us disc. The F1, we did disc cross disc. And F2, we got disc, long, and sphere. Where it was 32, sorry, 32 long, 270 disc, and 178 sphere. Because I'm warning you that this is an epistasis problem, what do you know turns out to be the genotype here? They're both heterozygous. Automatically, I know that's the answer. It's how we're going to get that deviation from a 9331. Epistasis problem, somewhere in here, is going to be that. So if I look at those numbers, 270, 32, and 178, I need to get a variation on 9331. So what variations could I have? Did I bring my markers? Of course I didn't. We're having a good day. If I take 9331, boo. So we take 9331. What can we get? We can do... 961, we could do a 1231, we could do a 934, I could do a 15 and 1, I could do a 9 and a 9 and a 7. I don't know which of these looks like it could match. Easiest thing to do is find the smallest number. Does it look like a multiple of the others? In other words, if I divide 270, 32, and 178 by the smallest number there, which is 32, what do you get? Well, that's a 1. What do you get for disk? About. About 9. And then for sphere, you get about 6. Does that match any of my ratios? A 9, a 1, and a 6. It's that one right there. Pose an explanation for these results. It's epistasis. There's epistatic relationships. Okay, so we need to explain this. So for disc and for long, I know that to get to the F1, I need to get big A, little a, big B, little b, cross big A, little a, big B, little b. Thinking back to what we did Monday, namely, how do you get your triple mutant? How did we get to this point? Took a homozygote where it's dominant and recessive, and we took it, cross it with another homozygote that's a dominant and a recessive. Easiest way to get to our answer? Do the same thing here. So let's say that. So here's going to be disc, here's going to be disc.
Although, is there another way I can get, because I'm now looking at this and I'm saying, okay, I need disk and these to match each other. Hmm. This isn't going to work for us. Here's why. That six there has to be this. That's where my six is. Which means my parents can't be homozygous, heterozygous, and homozygous, heterozygous. They actually need to be totally dominant. So the long, which was the itty bitty baby one, which is a one, must be the total recessive. So once I do that, That's my disk for my nine. My sphere is clearly indistinguishable between those two. So there's some type of redundancy going on. We have our little a, little b, little b, which would be our long, which is our one. Snapdragon plant that was bred true with white is crossed with a plant that's red blue for solid. All the F1 is white. Okay, so we did parental is white cross solid purple. F1 is white. The F1 is self among the F2. I get 240 white, 61 solid purple, and 19 spotted purple. Describe what's going on. Here, okay, we should probably test the pattern. Um, let's go off of the smallest one, so 19. So 61 divided by 19 is about 3. So we have 1 and a 3. 240 divided by 19 is about 12. We have a 12 to 3 to 1. Does that match any of our patterns? Yeah, it's the third one listed. So this is a 12 to 3 to 1 ratio. So provide genetic explanation for this. This would be epistasis. If I had to tell me what that white was, that white has to be big A, little a, big B, little b, cross big A, little a, big B, little b. So here, because the solid is one of those threes, so the spotted is easy, it's recessive, that solid needs to be one of the letters, the A or the B needs to be dominant. It doesn't matter which one you want to be the dominant. You tell me, which A or B? A? Okay. That's solid. So that means the white would be either big A, big B, or it's big B, and then who knows what comes after it. Because those two there would add up to the 12. To make that happen, clearly, to get to this white coloration, the only thing that matters is that capital letter. It trumps whatever's going on with the A. All that matters to get to this number, to this phenotype, is that capital B. It doesn't matter if there's a capital A there or not. So it's a dominant that's overtaking the other gene. So we call this one dominant epistasis.
So what would be my genotypes for the parents? Well, the solid needs to follow this pattern, which means the other one is probably going to be little a, little a, big B, big B. Because when I combine these, big A and little a give me that combo. A big B and a little b will give me that combo. This is an example of being redundant. So it's a redundant epistasis. It's not one of the words that we used before. But it's clearly showing that these two kind of are doing the same thing. So it's one or the other. But if you have both, ooh, look, it's even better. This one's a fun one. This one here. Figure it out, email it to me by 9 p.m. tonight. I'll give you extra credit if you can figure it out. So you know, what I would do is you need to look at what you did, what we have up here. For the most part, Punnett squares are stupid. These ones, they're useful. I would highly recommend... So if you look, it's 50, 25, 25. So that means it's going to be a Punnett square that has four boxes. Or you might need to consider a Punnett square that has eight boxes. What I would do is figure out what goes inside and then reverse engineer it out to see could you figure it out. We'll talk about this one on Monday. But... See if you can figure it out. We can do other weird things. These problems are easy to point out once you know what to look for. Cytoplasmic inheritance does not follow Mendel in any way, shape, or form because there is no such thing as diploid. It is a one and a done. This happens when the trait is from either the chloroplast or from mitochondria. Usually these ones are dangerous. Mitochondrial diseases um, are exclusively from mom. If you have a mitochondrial disorder, which usually manifests by something affecting your nervous system or your muscles, you will get it from the mom and all the children get it. It's 100% of the offspring get it. What if the dad has it? it? Turns out during fertilization, when the sperm comes on in, the mom's cell says, what's that? When pointing at the mitochondria, and immediately destroy the mitochondria. So all inheritance is from mom unless she doesn't kill off the mitochondria, which is an anomaly, but that exists. So all mitochondrial disorders are inherited from mom to children, never from father to children. It turns out to be the exact same thing with plants if you have a chloroplast disorder. So if you were super careful and you keep track of how you're doing your crosses, if it's pollen, or egg, it changes the outcome of the crosses. And we can get these weird banding patterns on plants. That's because it's a chloroplast problem that the female gametophyte is giving to its offspring. The, the pollen do not contribute. We also have this weird thing here called a maternal effect. And this is when the mom influences the cell. So she kind of pushes the cell to express certain genes and not others and guides pathways. 
this isn't as big deal in mammals, but when you have others where like temperature matters, well then the behavior of the mother will affect what happens. So the mom gets, the, gets to influence the outcome. Those problems are really hard. We're not going to do any of those. Here's a table of all, everything just being listed out that you can't read up there. I'm going to have to dramatically alter the... Uh, thinking through what I need to do. These are important. We're going to skip. Any of you micro majors? No micro majors? Sweet. Yeah, we're skipping. Say, if we were a micro major, oh crap. This is all about you. This, you care about all of this. But oh, no micro majors? Okay. They're important, but uh, I'm not going to mess around. There are some weird things with mutations. We could have a mutation that's referred to as a gain of function. That's when you get some type of new ability. This usually manifests in what we call oncogenes. Oncogenes are the ones that cause cancer. So you get a mutation, you get a new phenotype. What's the new phenotype? Cancer! You gain function. You have a mutation in this gene. Congratulations, you can't get the bubonic plague. You got a new phenotype. You got a gain of function. We also have this weird concept called haplosufficiency and haploinsufficiency. This has to do with incomplete dominance. If you have a haploinsufficient individual or combination, what that means is whatever that gene is expressing, whatever it's doing, is not enough for a full phenotype. What would you call this individual in this case? Incomplete dominance. You tried to make the red pigment. You didn't do a good enough job. So I guess you kind of made a little bit of it. You were insufficient to get the full red expression. But it's still there, so I guess you're pink. No, this is not an epistasis. This is just classic one trait. This is not epistasis. Haplosufficient is when one copy is enough, meaning the heterozygote looks like the homozygote. All you need is one copy and one bit of gene product is more than enough to help you through. So Haploinsufficient, the question of do you make enough gene product to see the result? And if you don't, sorry, you're incompletely dominant because the heterozygote does not look like the dominant. But if it's haplosufficient, one is more than sufficient, more than enough to make enough product that it looks just like the dominant. Homozygous dominant. They're indistinguishable. How do you know which one you're dealing with. Cross it and find out. You can't look and automatically know if a gene is going to be haplosufficient or a haploinsufficient gene. You have to do the test and look. The dominant negative, which is where we're going to stop, I'll record the last bit. It'll be fast because it's, it's sex linkage. There's only one thing that's kind of weird with it. Although it deals with like cats. And people like calico cats. So if you're a cat person, you'll like this next bit. If you're not a cat person, skip that part. Although I have a practice problem to deal with it. The dominant negative is a very strange phenomenon that exists and it causes trouble. The dominant negative is a protein product, so this 
to make this happen, you have proteins interacting with each other. So it's bio 340. So we have proteins interacting with proteins. If everything is normal, the interaction is good and functional. A dominant negative is we have a mutation that's going to lead to an altered protein. That altered protein does not have good function. And what it does is it's a saboteur. So when you, normally you would have these two proteins interacting, life is good. We have the dominant negative interacting with the normal protein, and the result is decreased function. This one Altered protein is enough to ruin the pair. And the root, the cause, or the result is so bad that it becomes a dominant phenotype. One is enough to ruin all of the expression. So one is enough to reduce functionality. And if you reduce the functionality, we call that being negative. We call it dominant because it just takes one to ruin everything. One copy is enough to ruin it. It is not the same as a dominant allele. A dominant allele means you make something that works. This is, you can have a mutation. All you need is one mutation to cause this, and it will ruin everything else. It would be, it's not necessarily that. It's, for the most part, you're making big M. Or big A. You're making big A. Normal. Yay. Everything works. In one of your cells, you make a little A that's a little bit weird. That little A, that gene product, it's a protein, once you let it out into your circulatory system, whenever it runs into the normal functioning A, it says, nope, I'm going to take you out. Nope, I'm going to take you out. Nope, I'm also going to take you out. Nope, I'm going to take you out. So that one bad apple literally ruins it for everything else. So you don't need to have it, this get inherited. This is usually something that, oops, it shows up. There's a version. It's not exactly a dominant negative, but here's an example. I know that it's time. But it's terrifying. Do any of you know what that word is? Prions? It's a prion. Prions are infectious proteins. It's a virus that's not a virus. So what prions do, we all have the genes for prions. Every single one of us has them. Some of us will get the right mutation in one of your cells that you will then switch the prion from being a normal version to being a freakish version. And what this freakish version does is it goes around and says, are you like me? No. Kill Interacts. Doesn't kill the protein. It turns you into me. That's it's not cancer because it's a protein. It's a protein that changes other proteins to turn into it. And all you need is one. What's the disease? Mad cow. That's mad cow. How do you get mad cow? Eat the cow. That's all you had to do. But we have a digestive system. That will destroy it. It doesn't. We don't stop these things. All it takes is one. I'll have sex linkage online for you all. It'll be pretty short. 
So here's the topic we didn't get to, but it'll be easy. So we're going to talk sex linkage. And here you can obviously see the big ideas. So we know that chromosomes are where genes are found, and your total set of all your chromosomes is what we call a karyotype. We only make karyotypes with metaphase chromosomes because they're the most compact. We can tell the chromosomes apart based upon banding patterns and size similarities, meaning that's how I know that these are chromosome one as opposed to these, which are chromosome two, and then chromosome three and so forth. One is gonna be the largest, 22 is gonna be the smallest. We used to do these by hand, now they're all done by computer, so details. The human karyotype is 2n equals 46, so we always talk about the diploid number. Typically, the first 22 are numbered 1 through 22, and then what we would say is your XX or XY. So if I look at this individual here, person, it says 46 XY, so this would be what we would deem to be a male, unquote, quote, unquote. If you are a male or an XY individual, you are deemed to be heterogametic, meaning you make two different types of gametes, as opposed to being homogametic, which means you make one type of gamete. And you'd say, but isn't an egg an egg and a sperm a sperm? Yes except that a sperm can either have an X or a Y in it, but eggs always will have Xs. So that's what we mean by homogametic versus heterogametic. Sometimes you'll get karyotypes that look like this. So if I were to look at this individual here, what I would call this person, because if you notice, there's one X, but there's no Y. So we actually have a total of 45 chromosomes. This individual would be a 45 X, O, this is actually a syndrome called Turner syndrome, which is when you turn out to have a missing, or you only have one sex chromosome. We've known that genes are found on chromosomes for quite a while. This was in part the work of Thomas Hunt Morgan and his grad student, Alfred Sturvant. Their organism of choice was Drosophila melanogaster, I've also heard Drosophila pronounced Drosophilia, and I was like, wait, what? Is this, is this Britishisms, and I don't know it? Anyway, they worked with the fruit fly. And what they started to notice is when they would be getting inheritance patterns, that there was a pattern between the inheritance and what was going on with the chromosomes. Like always, if, if you were to track where the chromosomes were or if a portion of a chromosome was missing, they noticed certain traits missing. And it was a, oh, odds are we're having those genes found on chromosomes. One of the other things that they discovered was there were two different groups of chromosomes. One group are referred to as autosomes. The other group are referred to as sex chromosomes. Autosome chromosomes are found in all cells regardless and so now I'm speaking in terms of animals as a whole or organisms as a whole. When I talk about sex, because gender isn't necessarily as big of a thing with them, but it is with us, so the human animal, as opposed to sex chromosomes, which will differ depending on the sex. So we've seen this, where our autosomes for humans is 1 through 22, and we vary at the X and the Y. Each of the chromosomes has plenty of diseases associated with it. So each chromosome has disease. That's because each of them turn out to have traits associated with them. In lab, you're looking at a disease gene and it turns out across all nine lab sections, they're all spread out, so each lab section is assigned a different chromosome, and they still get these big old lists of your things that can go wrong. Any type of gene that is found on a sex chromosome 
is called sex linked. So these are genes found on sex chromosomes. So when we look at what's going on in mammals, it turns out on the sex chromosomes, there's something referred to as a pseudo-autosomal region between the X and the Y, and just for the sake of showing it to you, the Y chromosome is really small. The X chromosome is rather large, but these need to pair up during meiosis one, or uh, pro and metaphase one. And the way that they pair up is these top portions that are referred to as pseudo-autosomal regions. So they pair at pseudo-autosomal regions. So the reason why we call them pseudo-autosomal is because they're the same between the two chromosomes, so it's acting like it, they're autosomes, but they're not pseudo, it's fake. And then it turns out that you know we have all sorts of different stuff in between the autosomal regions. There turn out to be numerous X-linked genes, and there are not that many Y-linked genes. At least if you were in my lab, I showed you a paper that actually discusses a potential Y-linked gene dealing with um, hearing loss and very loose data dealing with uh, prostate issues. This automatically leads to an issue, a conundrum. Females have two X's, males have one. For the sake of saying it, um, I'm going to always refer to male, female as in this pattern. And it's not necessary to discount the fact that we have variation on what we mean by male and female and sex actually comes in a spectrum. But we're going to be speaking in the bimodal fashion, meaning we have two main peaks. And it's not to discount everything in the middle. It's just so that it simplifies what we're talking about. And some of these ideas are hard enough as is. And if we actually go into the real nuances, it, it just makes some of the discussion kind of unbearable. So that's why I'm going to be speaking with these old fashioned terms just for the sake of saying it. Because females have two X's and males have one X, this leads to a conundrum that we call the dosage problem. What this means, dosage problem, is females express two times the X genes that males do. And the result of that is we throw off the you know, cell's chemistry. This is actually not good to express twice as much of something and not with something else. So what we have is what we call a dosage problem or a, an, an, a dosage compensation. So in us mammals, we have what's called X chromosome inactivation. And that is a way of compensating for one sex having twice as much gene product as the other. It does lead to some interesting things like the calico and the tortoise shell cats. So calico cats are always female, but tortoise shells can be all over the place. Um, although I think they're also primarily female, the tortoise shells. The tortoise shells I don't know as much about as opposed to the calico cats. But with the calico cats, what they turn out to be is they have an orange and a black allele found on X chromosomes. This is how we mark this. If, we, if it's a trait found on X chromosome, you write the X so that we know it's sex linked. And what will happen is we will, the cat will randomly inactivate one of its chromosomes. So embryonically, one spot, the black or the X chromosome that had the black allele is expressed. 
but not the orange. And in another spot, it's only going to be the orange that's expressed because we can totally condense out the black. The white splotches are something else. So that's a separate gene that's causing that. And to a lesser extent, that's what's going on with tortoise shells too. It's this alternative um, inactivation of chromosomes. What we do when we have a mammalian X chromosome inactivation is we actually turn it into heterochromatin. So we convert one X chromosome to full heterochromatin. If you recall, heterochromatin is all compacted up. And when it's all compacted up, we can push it off to the side. And when you look at cells, especially if it's a female cell, you'll see these little chunks thrown off to the side. And these are referred to as bar bodies. And that bar body is the inactive X chromosome. Mammals utilize an activation of the X chromosome, but that's not the only option. So if I look at the fruit fly, where it's XY as well, what they will do instead is they double the X expression in a male. Nope. so that it matches the two, the two X's of the female. If you turn out to have a worm like C. elegans, what they do is if you turn out to be um, male, female is the number of X chromosomes that you have. So what they do is they just reduce transcription. So they cut it in half. By cutting each of the X's in half, it equals a full X, which is going to be what the male is. So they actually just reduce how much expression they have. So there's three different ways by which we can compensate. We knock out one of the chromosomes, we double the single chromosome, or we can cut the double chromosomes in half in terms of their transcription. There are some weird patterns when it comes to sex chromosomes. In mammals, it is a male XY, female XX. In birds, it's the opposite. It's the male is ZZ and the female is ZW. So the females are heterogametic and the males are homogametic in birds. Insects are kind of all over the place. Lepidopterans, which is to say moths and butterflies, are like birds. Dipterans, so flies, are like mammals. Then you have these weirdos, the hymenoptera. So hymenoptera, these are the stinging insects. So these are bees, wasps, hornets, ants. So they turn out to be XX or XO. So XX is going to be the female, XO is going to be the male. This funky little junction thing that we have here that with the chromosomes actually manifests itself when we look at the platypus. The platypus is actually really weird. They have five sex chromosomes. So they have an X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. And then if you're a male, you also have a Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, and Y5. And when we map, do uh, syntonies, so we look to see where the chromosomes match each other, it turns out the platypus sex chromosomes don't really match any of our sex chromosomes. But they do, to some degree, match the Z chromosome found in birds. So it's kind of a, huh, well, look at that. They really are a blending. 
the 2, 3, 12, 13, 16, 17, these are standard mammalian chromosomes. One of the ways that, or one of the things that we notice when we look at linked traits is when we look at who has the trait. So white flies are a pleiotropic. I pointed them out to you before, how the white eye mutation in Drosophila melanogaster causes some issues. Namely, um, if you have the white eye, you tend not to survive too great. So one of the things that we would notice is if I were to take a red-eyed female and cross it with a white-eyed male, every, all the offspring have red eyes. If I do a self-cross, I get half the males have white eyes, then all the rest have red eyes. So, red-eyed female, white-eyed male, all the F1 are reds, all, so in case you're, so the cross, red female, white male, all the offspring are red eyes, so we cross those. The males are white eyes, the females are red eyes. So what I'm gonna do is something called a reciprocal cross. A reciprocal cross is you switch the genders. Or the sexes, more appropriately it's the sexes. So when we do that, so this was cross A, so red, female, white, male. If I switch it so it's a white female and a red male, what I get is if you compare these results, they differ from each other. If I compare the results of the F2, they differ from each other. When we see different results, depending on who has the trait, if it's the male or the female, this is evidence of sex linkage. The reason for this one turns out to be the male is hemizygous. And because sex link traits depend on if you're homo or uh, homogametic or heterogametic, it affects how things would inherit. If you are hemizygous, that means you have one chromosome. So the karyotype of the male is heterogametic, but if we're talking about the alleles, you're hemizygous. This would be that previous cross just drawn out in symbols. So for cross A, we have the red female and the white male only the red um, chromosome is functional. So we pass that on, hooray. When we run through meiosis with the F1, we get all these options and the result is we get three to one reds to white. But when we do cross B and we switch it, so the female has only the white allele, that makes it so that cross results in only the white allele being passed on. The male makes two choices. Because remember, the male makes two options because he's gonna be heterogametic. Female only makes one option because she's homogametic. When I do these combos, so I can take those two or those two, those yield those I combos. Now we make those options, but they're both with the X chromosome. Over here we have an X and a Y. We get our different combinations half red, half white. And it all has to do with how we start. Um, whenever we say the term sex linked, in mammals, what we mean is it's on the X chromosome. So we can call it a sex linked trait or an X linked trait. It is very rare to have a Y linked trait, but this is the paper that at least my lab section got to see. If you're in Michelle's, hopefully you saw it. There are lots of sex-linked traits that cause trouble, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, so you have issues moving, male pattern baldness, hemophilia, you have issues blood clotting, hypertrichosis, which is you have um, too much hair. 
You also have colorblindness. Or at least red green colorblindness. When you work problems, it does matter the sex of, or the type of organism, not the sex, but the type of organism, because birds and mammals are not the same. Because in mammals, for the female versus the male, the female is homogametic, the male is heterogametic, but in birds, the male is homogametic and the female is heterogametic. So an example, in chickens, beak color is controlled by a sex-linked gene. Dark beats are dark beaks are dominant to light beaks. So because we're talking about chickens, which is a bird, this is a ZW problem. So what we have is dark beaks are dominant to light beaks. A female with a dark beak, so that would be Z, capital D, is mated with a male with a light beak. That would be Z, Z, little d, little d. Female needs to have a W. In the F1, the females have light beaks and the males have dark beaks. Is that what would make sense? If I were to sit there and make a Punnett square out of this, we can take a look. So there's a light beak female, light beak female, dark beak male, dark beak male. Yep, it works. Diagram the PNF1 crosses, use genetic symbols. Oh. Well, okay, done. <laughs> uh, an F1 cross would be this. So, okay, hooray. Uh, clearly show the unorganized genotype and phenotypes of the F2. So if I were to figure out for the F2, these are usually when Punnett squares are helpful. So I write down my options. So one, two options, one, two options. I fill it in. Looks like this. So what do I have? quarter of the males, or one quarter will be male with a dark beak. That would be this one. We are one quarter male with a light beak. <laughs> would be right there. We're one quarter female with a dark beak. Right there and then we have a quarter of them are female with light beaks easy next week we're gonna work on pedigrees and then three-point test crosses um, part of your homework but it's not graded is to gather data from family. You're going to be looking at certain traits, like you're going to be looking at attached versus unattached earlobes. Can you taste PTC? Do you have a widow's peak or not? The hitchhiker's thumb, I didn't show you guys what hitchhiker's thumb looks like, but if you have a hitchhiker's thumb, literally your thumb snaps at an angle. It looks really weird. I don't have one. And then if you're colorblind or not. Good luck.